not very long ago. Yes. Uh, so we welcome you to the interview. We will do some introduction for the sake of the record. My name is Martha Kome. I'm the chairperson of the Judicial Service Commission, and I welcome you to this interview. And uh, my name is Machari Njero, I'm the vice chair, and welcome. Good morning once again. Good morning, Commissioner. Oluande Evelyn, welcome. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Jacqueline Ngutia, Commissioner, welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, my lord. My name is Mohamed Ibrahim, judge of the Supreme Court, Commissioner. Welcome. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, Honorable Kendagor. Good morning, my lady. Uh, Fatuma Sichale, judge of appeal and Commissioner. Karibu. Thank you, Thank you very much. Good morning, Honorable Kendago. Good morning, Commissioner. My name is Charity Kisutu, a commissioner. Welcome. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning. My name is Isaac Ruto, a member of the JSC. Good morning. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, Honorable Kendago. Good morning, Commissioner. Welcome once again. My name is Nzilani Caroline. I, I wish you well. Karibu. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is David Majanda, Judge and Commissioner. Welcome. Thank you, my lord. Thank you, Honourable Commissioners, for that introduction. Um, Honourable Kendago, before we go into the interview, where the Commissioners will be asking you questions on your application that you have made for the position of the Judge of the High Court, please confirm your county. I come from El Geo Maracut County. And your ethnicity? My ethnicity is Kalenji from the Marakwet sub-tribe. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Masharia will take it from here. Okay, yeah, just a few questions. Um, now, I'm looking at your CV, uh, and you've worked, of course, uh, quite well in the institution of the judiciary. Could you explain um, what the key driver that motivates you into wanting to become a, a judge? There must be those things that, you know, in your life or in your career that, you know, have driven you into wanting to rise now to a higher level of a, a judge. Thank you very much, Commissioner, and uh, thank you, Commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to attend this interview. My drive to become a judge is uh, rooted in uh, my commitment to serve in the judiciary. I have risen through the ranks in, uh, in magistrate, joined the judiciary as a district magistrate uh, to prof, and uh, I share in the aspiration of every magistrate that in the ascension of the ranks in magistracy that would get to an opportunity to serve in, as a judge. And um, you know, you are currently acting as a registrar of mediation, uh, you know, which is, is a function that you know it's agreed that you've also carried out you know quite well now what are the key uh you know lessons that you've learned in uh, as a registrar of uh, mediation that you think you'd apply if you were to become a judge thank you commissioner one of the biggest lessons that i have learned as the registrar mediation and overseeing the implementation of mediation in the judiciary is the importance of result-based management. So being able to look at uh, reflections of how is it that we are doing things, but at the same time evaluating to see what is it that we can learn as a, on a learning curve from what we are getting out of the data that we have, uh, from the stories in mediation, from the implementation and the institutional frameworks, as well as the legal and policy frameworks. My final two questions. There has been uh, allegations or claims by some that uh, mediation is being forced on parties whereas it's supposed to be something that you know parties choose by themselves but that notwithstanding that uh, sometimes the judges or judicial officers will opt the easy way out so that you know a city wide they can remove the obligation of hearing the matters from themselves and push it over now to mediation i don't know what to be your view about it and uh, also, as you answer that, to state what's the best way of dealing with that issue so that that perception 
this uh, you know is, is, is you know it's not there that parties are being forced into it thank you honorable commissioner the implementation of court annexed mediation as we have and the model that we have assumes a mandatory nature which uh, takes away the voluntary aspect of parties submitting to the process but it doesn't necessarily require of them that when they go to mediation they must go and agree there was uh, quite a consideration and uh, issues that we've been talking about as a learning curve as i mentioned with the uh, task force that is overseeing the implementation of mediation and the lessons at that time borrowed from what is happening globally as well as trying to work out uh, the best model that we'd use to be able to give effect to article 159. so borrowing from that and the considerations that that were made we adopted the model of uh, uh, mandatory mediation uh, we are aware of the challenges that uh, this has come with including the expectation by parties that they would want to to have their say or they would like to even have a, a greater uh, you know like decision making prior to referral to mediation so in order to cushion this we no longer refer matters directly without mentioning them in court so we give parties an opportunity that we can explain the mediation process to them we can also tell them what their roles and responsibilities in mediation are and generally what to expect over time from the pilot phase up to now there have been some changes that have cushioned this to be able to address the balance of access to justice including the issue of uh, affording parties an opportunity to select a mediator of choice and again uh, giving them an opportunity during the mentions that they can tell us if there are any issues that may hinder uh, the parties benefiting in mediation my final question you know you can already see that uh, this branch of mediation is becoming big in fact uh, I think even recently for the first time uh, a budget was created even for the alternative justice system uh, you recall the you know the um, retreat we had in uh, in uh, Naivasha where yes. we all agreed that we need to focus resources on it and you've done well you are still acting and it's a baby that you're still building then uh, uh, of course you'd want to become a judge but wouldn't it be better than if we confirm you as the registrar of mediation you build this baby and uh, once his family established now then you can cross over because you know it's a big position also registrar of mediation not to question why you'd want to become a judge of course you have a right but I'm just wondering whether you think that, that would be something that you would consider thank you honorable yes. commissioner uh, i'd like to appreciate the commission and the judiciary for the responsibility that has been given to me to midwife mediation and and generally the implementation of it on a national basis i have come back with a report card and i am requesting to be allowed to take up more opportunities I'd be able to still serve and support the implementation of alternative dispute resolution, in fact, coming in from a heavier role of the experiences that I have had. Uh, besides that, com Honorable Commissioners and Chair, uh, we have also worked on uh, court annexed mediation from the pilot phase up to the phase where we are now. And uh, uh, besides the learning curve, we have also set up institutional frameworks that would be able to support mediation. And even if somebody else was to come on board and steer, we have an action, pla an action plan that is already in place. We have set up tools. Uh, we are now on our fourth phase of implementation and national rollout. And uh, the term that is coming to an end in, uh, in July this year, uh, uh, we have also set in motion preparation of a uh, five-year uh, plan that will be longer now and of course leveraging on uh, the gains and the guiders we have under the stage honorable Kendagor, um, i'll ask you very simple questions that relate to your work as a magistrate thank you um and uh, these fall under the sexual offenses act um you're undertaking a trial uh, of uh, an accused person who's been charged with an offense under the Sexual Offenses Act. You've come to the end of the trial, and you're now at the point of convicting or sentencing the accused person. Uh, and of course, for you, um, and given the statute, you want to impose a custodial sentence. 
and assuming that the person has been in custody all through, when does the sentence begin to run? Thank you very much for the time. And the issue of sentencing is something that uh, uh, remained uh, emerges and uh, depending on the age of uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the victim. Uh, in this instance, uh, consideration as to whether it is an adult, and then there are provisions that have been made, and where it is a minor, there are also provisions that have been made. In line with the uh, consideration and the emerging jurisprudence that we've been having, I would also give an opportunity to the, the victim to be able to assess how has uh, uh, this incident affected the, the victim. Mishimura, Mishimura, sorry to cut you short. Uh, my question was very spin to run. Uh, it will begin to run at the time when I pass the sentence, my lady. Maybe you've been in uh, guilty as charged. I'll uh, uh, look at the elements of uh, uh, criminal liability. Uh, and uh, uh, one of them is whether the act was committed by the accused person. So one, whether the act was committed. Number two would be uh, the criminal intention of, uh, uh, by the accused person, which would be the the men's realm. And then I would also look at uh, uh, the evidence that I submitted uh, uh, during the trial. <laughs> I'm satisfied with only one answer, Thank you. You, but that's okay. We'll leave it for another day. Thank, Thank you. you. Maybe. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe I'll take you to the familiar ground. Thank you. And ask you uh, when a party would invoke an arbitration. When and how? Thank you very much, Honorable Chief Justice. A party can invoke arbitration where they have uh, provisions in the contractual agreements that they have uh, and have selected arbitration as the choice of alternative dispute resolution. They can also uh, uh, select or uh, be referred to mediation when they, uh, to arbitration when they have come to court and uh, they haven't exhausted the remedy uh, and the choice of alternative dispute resolution mechanism that they have as stipulated in their contractual mm. agreements. Yes, um, happy with that. Um, just uh, tell us uh, if you were successful in this being to become a judge and an application was or a petition was brought before you uh, seeking to declare a statute or some provisions of the statute and <coughs> constitution. What are the guiding principles that would guide you? Thank you very much, uh, uh, my lady. In uh, looking at a statute and uh, whether it is uh, constitutional, I would look at it from two angles. One is whether it uh, contravenes uh, the provisions of the constitution and uh, on number two, on the issue of uh, uh, the process in which that statute has been developed. So the guiding pr principles that I would look at is uh, number one, as to whether uh, first, again, going back to the issue of the principles of the purpose and principles of the constitution. Then number two is about the issue of uh, uh, the Bill of Rights. Uh, number three is on the issue of uh, uh, that it advances the law. And then number four is on uh, um, advances the law, and number four is on uh, governance, whether it uh, promotes good governance. Okay, very well. Uh, finally, you have been sent to a station, and there is a backlog of cases. I want you to tell this uh, commission how, what you would do to make sure that the station becomes efficient. Thank you very much, my lady. For a station to be efficient, it would go beyond just the uh, sitting in court and uh, uh, waiting for the files to come and writing rulings and judgments. It is important to create a, a, a cycle uh, where a quality cycle that would ensure that the back office as much as the front office is uh, operating very well and in a coordinated manner. So uh, I, I would look at it from an approach of uh, creating the quality circle 
right through from uh, uh, the filing of the, the case and right through to the processing of it to the time that it would now come before me as a judge. That is active case management. Yes, my lady. What else would you do? Uh, besides this, uh, I also did election uh, scrutinies. I did taxations and uh, now in the transition into mediation, I have been largely involved in legal and policy development of the law and mainstreaming just to see that uh, mediation comes in at a table where we can implement and be able to achieve the outcomes, not just in terms of the cases that are referred, but again the quality of uh, uh, success of the process. Beyond that, my Lord, I have uh, uh, in, in active engagement of the law, also participated in uh, very many uh, deliberations that have happened, especially on the front of uh, legal and policy, including representing the judiciary in conversations with the legislature about uh, uh, the bills that had been presented previously that touch on mediation uh, and alternative dispute resolution. Okay, so how does this tell us, your Judge Reggie, all this? Thank you, my Lord. I have learned so much and, uh, uh, and gained so many skills out of uh, uh, my experience in alternative dispute resolution. And just generally the measure to look at cases from uh, 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 an, an interest of uh, what are the practical solutions that are, can be put in place to be able to address these cases. Mm -hmm. And out of the skills and the leadership experience that I have had in uh, court and next mediation, I am judge ready to be able to uh, to serve and take on more responsibilities. Thank you, Honorable C. Um, <laughs> sorry, I had a line of questioning which I prepared, but uh, because of your paper, uh, very, very interesting, in, in my view, very controversial topic. You wrote um, for your proposal for master's degree, you proposed uh, a, a topic called uh, Alternative Justice Systems and Criminal Justice in Kenya, revisiting the jurisdiction, jurisdictional limits of Masla courts in criminal cases. Masla courts. What are Masla courts for the benefit of members here? Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Commissioner. The Masla Courts is a traditional dispute resolution mechanism that is mostly applied by the Muslim community. Okay, but uh, in Kenya we don't have, do you agree with me, there's nothing called Masla Courts. And I the, think that that's yes. your creation of the <laughs> paper. Uh, apologies, uh, uh, my lord. The, the reference in context is the, the uh, traditional dispute resolution mechanism. But why do you call have. it Masla Courts mm. in Kenya? We don't have that. Uh, I think I may have uh, maybe carried away with the, the angle of uh, uh, the research with which I was taking that takes a comparative uh, uh, okay. consideration with South right. Africa. Okay, as much as we, we love, and I think I, I do love, and we should promote AJS, AJS, but do you agree that in Kenya, under the constitution of Kenya, uh, that we are one republic, one state, and we cannot have different laws. Hmm? I, I agree, my lord. And you agree that Muslims have personal law issues catered for by the Kadhis courts. So tell me why we should have murder treated differently in different communities, or rape or defilement. Uh, thank you very much, my lord. Um, it's not that uh, uh, it, the offenses need to be treated differently or that the communities are, uh, uh, need to be treated differently, uh, but rather an approach on uh, uh, how justice is being handled in different communities. And uh, again, uh, falling back to whose justice is it. So my examination and the experience that I have had in alternative dispute resolution is that sometimes as we may hear the cases in court and pass rulings and judgments, they sometimes do not really address the question of justice as the parties or as the communities may perceive them. What about the law? There were many wishes by communities, by groups. All I'm concerned with that you are, now I, I see that, um, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm really um, wondering. There are two cases you gave us, 
that right. murder cases yes. have been withdrawn because of uh, settlement by families or ethnic groups and money is paid, blood money is paid. Mm -hmm. So why should we have a law like that in one community and not, and then the law is clear, the penal code is clear. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, my lord. Uh, the proposal that I have in this... Like uh, defilement. Mm, yes. You have a, mm. a defilement rape. A rape... F f um, the allegations that um, in northeastern province, le girls, women are compelled by the elders to withdraw cases, complaints, mm. against their personal wishes. And they go and settle, money is paid, even, even the victim doesn't get anything. Mm. The elders share the money. Uh, it's, it's is that justice? No, it is not, my lord. It is not justice, and uh, uh, I, I, I would, it, it's, 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 it's very unfortunate that actually those incidences happen, and uh, the umbrella that we have been having under alternative dispute resolution is that as much as we are promoting the use of alternative dispute resolution as an institution, as a country, and the collective responsibility that we all have, especially with the justice actors, is to work together to ensure that we preserve the realm and uphold the rights of those that otherwise their rights would be violated by the use of alternative dispute resolution. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, my lord. Thank you. CJ, good morning once again, Your Honor. Good morning. Andrew. Just picking up uh, from where Judge Ibrahim has left with regards to the AJS, what is your understanding of the theory, agency theory of jurisdiction? Because I know the task force has uh, been speaking to the issue of uh, agency theory of jurisdiction of AJS. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Commissioner. So the, the agency theory looks at it in terms of uh, uh, conversations that are held uh, right through with the mechanisms that we have uh, and a classification in terms of uh, who, who, who is representing who in these conversations. So if I uh, pick it up from what uh, Honorable Commissioner was talking about, the, the, the issue of uh, uh, being had in, uh, uh, in ma being, uh, AJS being used in murder cases, then the agency theory is who is representing who in this matter? Whose interests are we preserving? Are we looking at the interests of the people who are coming in? If it is in murder, uh, you find that the conversations of the people who come on the table may not even necessarily be the, the first uh, uh, line of uh, family for the accused person. So when you talk about the agency, it is about bringing on board to ensure that the real people who are affected by this uh, uh, or use of this alternative dispute resolution, or rather the address of the justice actually reaches uh, or is addressed to, to the main people. And on the issue of, uh, for example, defilement, you've mentioned about um, my, <coughs> how about the issue of defilement. I know there are many communities, not just even in yeah. northern Kenya. I know in Ukambani there are those who call something with regards to Uji, Usu, something. Mm where the elders drink porridge and uh, an issue is resolved. So how would, if you are a, a, a judge and uh, you hear, or you're in a community and you hear the elders are saying they can handle defilement cases, if you are to use the agency theory of jurisdiction, how will you guide the elders with regards to that particular matter of defilement? Thank you, Honorable Commissioner. First, the elders are not allowed to deliberate on matters defilement under the traditional dispute resolution mechanisms. So I would empower them and uh, let them know that they're actually violating the rights of these children when they have these cases there, and they're not addressing the social vice. If you look at uh, how this, co uh, with the study that I have had on how the processes happen, the children are never even part of the discussion. The, 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 the issue of uh, the weight of the offense is carried on more of uh, uh, like perpetrated by the family members, by the friends, by, by the, the village, the community, and uh, while disregarding the rights of the, of, of the victims. So no, they are not allowed to, and I would ensure that if I'm serving uh, in a station where, uh, and, and of course with the hope that we'll all, all the court stations will be implementing alternative justice system, I will play a key role in uh, uh, the deliberations that we have, both at the level of uh, uh, the court itself 
and again at the level of uh, the members of the public who are the court users. Okay, thank you. My last question is on an equal distribution of justice in the country. As an acting registrar mediation, what have you done to ensure that counties or regions and courts that uh, are underserved by the justice actors get mediation because uh, I, I believe country much, but most of these mediation centers are in urban, well-developed uh, uh, cities. So Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner.